The cost of housing has risen dramatically over the past few years, helping drive levels of inflation not seen in decades. One key factor is that in many places, building has not kept up with demand. The suburban counties of Long Island, east of New York City, lag behind the nation. They have built less housing over the past decade than almost any comparable area in the country. After decades of fights, there are, there, there are over affordable housing. Paul Salmon reports on efforts to push for more development. A 14-acre eyesore in Huntington, Long Island, obtained by a local nonprofit to build housing. Matanical Cork, 146 units of affordable housing. Right, right now it looks like <laughs> scrubland, no? <laughs> yes, right now that's what it is, and it's been like this for 43 years. You heard right. 43 years. Pilar Moya Mancera runs Housing Help, the nonprofit which set out to build here when Jimmy Carter was president. Legal opposition and approval delays have blocked it through Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Bush, Obama, Trump, and Biden. Meanwhile, the cost of housing on Long Island has significantly increased year after year after year, even for a young professional, because there's hardly any supply of rental housing. Right over there, you can see the sign that bus drivers are needed. And this is all throughout Long Island, not just here. Though battles over affordable housing are a national commonplace, the counties that make up Long Island have a higher percentage of detached single-family homes than almost any large county in the country. Where did you live? So I lived on the uh, second floor. How much did it cost? It was around $3,000 a month. For how big an apartment? For a one bedroom apartment. For young folks who grew up here and wanted to stay, like 27-year-old Hunter Gross, buying was a pipe dream, renting a nightmare. You couldn't afford it anymore? No, unfortunately I couldn't. You go have a good public high school, you go to a good university, you get a good paying job, yet, the market rate apartments in the town of Huntington are pricing out young professionals who are making upwards of $100,000. Where has the opposition come from? So I would say a large part of the opposition are uh, the NIMBYs in the town of Huntington and across Long Island. And these are people who don't want affordable housing in their backyard. The NIMBYs, the not in my backyarders, determined to preserve the quiet suburb they moved to and make their resistance heard. It is not just an issue of affordable housing. Even if it was exclusive housing, there are issues of density, traffic, and schools. We have to talk about making it affordable for everybody. When this gets built and there's 146 units, that's great for the 146 people that are going to live there, but what about everybody? So Hector Gavia, lifelong local resident and real estate broker. Developers like to build, and if they could put more people in, in the same space, they're gonna, they're gonna wanna do that. And that definitely creates more high density and more people. And, uh, you know, it definitely creates more congestion and, and more traffic. But mainly, insists wow. Gavia, it's government subsidies to developers and lower income residents that taxpayers will ultimately pay for that drive his opposition to projects like Matinecock Court. We don't have an affordability problem. What we really have is a tax problem. And we have some of the highest property taxes on Long Island. So all this is doing is just contributing to that. I'm OK with building any building as long as it doesn't cause taxpayers to suffer more in having to subsidize, because we're already suffering enough here by continuing to pay all these taxes. Moya Mancera, though, thinks Long Islanders have long had a problem that precedes taxes. Let's tell it for what it is. We do have a history of housing segregation, and there was a lot of fear, not only here, but all throughout Long Island. Levittown, a community designed for modern living. It's fear with a history. In the 1940s, farms across the island were being turned into neighborhoods. The iconic community of Levittown was the model single-family homes built as a community the GIs returning from World War II could afford. People of color explicitly kept out. More recently, after a Newsday hidden camera investigation, New York State cited three real estate brokerages for discriminating against home buyers of color. No surprise to Pilar Moya Mancera, who immigrated from Peru and eventually settled on Long Island in 1996.
I moved to a white upscale community. Within days that I moved into my house, I got a message on my door saying that I don't belong here, that I need to move out. I refused to move out. They left a second note saying that they were going to burn down my house. No. But I got a third note that they were going to kill me. When I received the third note, I was so pregnant and I said, I'm not gonna put the life of my baby at risk. So I told my neighbors, I'm moving out. But enough convinced her to stay, even volunteered to keep an eye on her house, and she became an affordable housing activist, who finally sees more Long Island neighbors coming around now that they're aging as she is. Now I don't have to go from being a helicopter mom to being an airplane grandmother. There is a place for my grandchildren. There is a place for my adult children to move in so they can live at my basement, right? A place for me to live for when I'm a senior citizen. But just as important may be the cost to Long Island's economy. Anne Shabunko Moore employs 82 people making parts for the military on Long Island, says she could hire 10 more, has even lured employees from other states. I paid their rent for a year, and then it was on them to find their own place. And Year here on you, you're paying the rent, and then? Went back, it was the sticker shock of the cost of living to buy a house. Because understand, renting, even renting a place here is upwards of 3,500 a month. So the CEO has a message for neighbors bemoaning density and taxes. You all taxpayers are benefiting from my employees working hard, right? The number of employees I hire, the number of employees that are getting paychecks, buying food at all these stores, right? I'm your economic impact that's making this region successful. And I'm telling you as a business owner, my people can't afford to buy a house. Right? They are going to leave. <laughs> it's hard enough to compete for talent. Now I have to find someone talented and able to afford housing. In fact, she's so desperate, she's looking for help from above. And I'm looking at my roof, right, a 57,000 square foot building, wondering, like, obviously there's structural engineering issues and sewer issues, but I'm thinking the footprint of this building, how many apartments can I put up there? Right? Come on, seriously? Come on, right? I'm thinking... Apartments right up there. I could, why not? Can I put a second floor on here where I can put 20 of my employees right on top? Wow. Right? We gotta do something. We gotta find square footage somewhere. Back at Matinecock, I asked the gas station owner across the street about the opposition. Yeah, it used to be a lot. Now, I mean, I don't see uh, too many people anymore against to this project. Because they need the worker. Yes, and also they understand about uh, how uh, expensive of living in Long Island. For the moment, the weeds still rule. But by early next year, shovels will uproot them, and 146 units of affordable housing will rise here. Yes, to Moya Mancera and others, 43 years late, but better than never. For the PBS NewsHour, Paul Salman on Long Island. Affordable housing, a problem, excuse me, a problem all across the country.